enough time, you will find the common ground and you build upon that. That's your foundation. Welcome. Wow, what happened there? Okay. <laughs> Hello, welcome. Final day of the Scope live stream, final CAFRA panel. Um, thank you for joining us, and I will now introduce our panelists. We will start with Mr. Terry Barnes. Hi, Terry. Welcome. Hello, Nancy. Nice to see you again. Good to see you as well. Thank you for joining us. Mr. Peter Detour. Hi, Peter. Thank you for joining us. Hello. And finally, Miss Liana Hudspeth. Hi, Liana. Hello. Everybody, thank you for joining us. Um, I wanted to bring Terry in. I want to explain to the audience. Terry is a policy expert. I'm going to hand over to Terry really quick so he can give us a brief on his background. Terry, would you please do that? Uh, oh, thanks, Nancy. Um, look, I've worked in uh, public policy for 40 years and health policy in one way or another for about 30. And uh, uh, in the course of that, I was a senior uh, uh, bureaucrat civil servant uh, in the Department of Health uh, in Australia. Uh, I also advised the state government on health matters down here in, in Melbourne. Uh, but, um, uh, but I was also for uh, two stints, two extended stints, uh, senior advisor to uh, two, two Australian health ministers, uh, Michael Wooldridge in the 90s and uh, a fellow you might have heard of called Tony Abbott uh, in the noughties. Um, and uh, I've been around all manner of uh, health politics and health policy debates, uh, uh, both when I worked in government and since. But uh, the one thing I'll say about the vaping debate, and I, I, I've developed a, a real keen policy interest in it, is that uh, of all the issues, and they've been, you know, and health is a, a very emotional, very passionate area. I think, uh, in terms of uh, some of this, has been the, probably the, the most difficult one as an issue that I've ever been involved in. It, it, really, it's become uh, very personal. Uh, some of the, some of the um, argy-bargy, the debate has become very nasty. Uh, and, um, and certainly, uh, I think it's become exceedingly uh, you know, difficult to actually have a, a sensible reason conversation. I mean, I heard Nancy before and Clive Bates talking about uh, you know, keeping it keeping it cool and, and, and dealing with the evidence. But uh, there are some people who just don't want to deal with the evidence on this. Uh, some people just uh, have absolutely, absolute opinions that just cannot be shaken. But uh, they're the ones who usually influence the actual policymakers. And that's part of the problem of all of this. So uh, really advocacy in this area, on this issue, uh, is a, a very challenging thing, particularly for consumers to, to actually crack that, that, um, that, crack that dike, break that wall down um, and get some get some real constructive dialogue, let alone attention. Now, that's true. And, uh, you know, I, I've been, I don't know if you've been watching the screen switches and I go, hey. um, I don't know if you've been watching any other parts of the live stream, but or I've been watching the chats. OK, and I'm seeing people that, that on one side, we're seeing a lot of advocates that are just burnt. They're just like, I can't do this anymore. It's a losing battle. And then on the other side, I see these people that are fired up and yeah, let's go get them, you know, and that's cool. But I keep trying to say to them, you know, you need to understand the nuance. You need to understand the context. We need to humanize this. Now, a lot of these people don't have experience um, directly with politicians and public health people. I mean, Peter Des, um, you know, Liana's relatively new, by the way. She's a relatively new consumer advocate. There she is. So I'm going to start with Peter. And I'm going to say, Peter, how understanding that every country has a different culture and a different context. So Peter, can you give us an example of how you were able to engage with your public health people and your government people and to be effective? Uh, how do I put this? Um, I, I guess to be effective, uh, just like what Terry said earlier and like what you said, Nancy, it must come first with a, with a real understanding of your current situation in your country. Because you're right. Um, I, we all appreciate the fact that uh, most of us are very passionate about this advocacy. 
But we also have it to take into consideration the difference in our personalities. Some are the rara types will we'll go out on the streets. Some are the thinkers. There are those that uh, are really very passionate, but uh, you know you're too busy with um, the same important matters like family, work, and all that stuff. But we're but we're very passionate with 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 what we want. So what we did here in the Philippines is, of course, we did a lot of trial and error, and then. Uh, after a few, uh, let's say, hurdles, we realized that we cannot attack in all at all fronts. We we had to break it down, and then um, we have to pick our battles. Um, also, depending on certain types, like right now, there are ongoing uh, policy debates in our uh, uh, Congre- in our Senate. And uh, part of the things that we've built, we've done before is slowly but surely, we're building our member our memberships. So right now, um, we can tap on those members to help us, you know, uh, uh, raise our voice in uh, larger groups in a way right now. So I guess that's how it is, Nancy. What I'm trying to say is we need to understand our strengths and that uh, through the years, as we progress with what we're trying to do in this advocacy, um, we keep on harnessing those strengths. And as we as we identify our weaknesses in our respective countries, if we have time, because we're passionate, we try to address it. And we just hope to God that when the when the right opportunity to harness those strengths and those arsenals that are within our capabilities. We just hope that it's there. But again, uh, to, Li- to Liana, who's relatively new, just don't get frustrated. Um, because I remember back in 2016, there's, there, there are ongoing debates with, with uh, public health officials. Nobody wants to listen to me. I, I think they're thinking, who's this guy? Who's this vapor dude coming off the streets or whatever? But whenever you get that opportunity to talk, raise your voice, give them the impression that you're passionate with, 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 with what you're doing and you know what you're doing. Because once they, once, once they see that, then everything else will follow. I guess, Nancy, that's what happened here in the Philippines. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, and, and the campaign as well. Um, I'm going to ask Terry, Liana, I'm not ignoring you. This is, you know that. You just interrupt if you have a question. Um, another thing that came up is discussing how advocacy, like you just said, Peter, it has different branches, you know, and you you build upon your strengths. In some advocacy groups, they have people that are very passionate and very experienced in media. And in some groups, they have lawyers. A lot of the groups, there's a lot of lawyers, actually, now that I think about it. Um, some groups have medical people and health people. So you've got to hit upon these these different branches to get around the situation. Terry, explain something to everyone about the importance of media, because that's one of the things, and as you and I both know, it is very difficult to get into the media and the messaging mainly. Ah, good question. Look, I think the problem uh, is that uh, the usual suspects have actually captured the media. Uh, that uh, uh, in terms of the medical lobby, in terms of um, uh, certain well-known, outspoken tobacco control advocates uh, who refuse to see any view of the world except their own, um, in terms of governments. So in the, the, the people who provide the, provide the information to the media, the people who provide the quotes to the media, um, pretty well uh, have got, got it locked up. So again, I talked about putting, uh, breaking down the dike. I mean, that's, that's a big wall that has to be done. Uh, but, you know, but informed, articulate, um, it, mainstream uh, consumers, I think, uh, have a real role to play, um, particularly if they get the opportunity, even if it's news stories where you're the token alternative point of view. Um, you can actually still get your point across if you have the, the right message, uh, the right grab if it's a TV or a, ra- a radio interview, um, or the right quote if it's a, if it's a newspaper one. Uh, but uh, I think it's important that this is is seen as a mainstream issue, not a fringe issue, not a libertarian issue, not a um, 
I think, uh, yeah, and one of the things that you find in, in health policy generally in politics is that when it comes to health, everybody thinks their issue is the most important one in the entire world and everything should be dropped to deal with it. I think vaping and vaping advocacy is no different as far as that goes. So part of, part of uh, understanding how to get your message across and using the media is understanding what the media is looking for. It's also understanding your opponents, you know, understanding why they think the way they do, why they act the way they do, why they're trying to shut you down the way they do. And, and, um, and, and not just going out there and, and saying something for the sake of saying something, but actually thinking about how it plays in, in the wider real world. Um, but I think it's very important that the vaping community, when it, when it is covered by the media, is seen as mainstream, ordinary members of the community. I mean, uh, uh, think about particularly TV when, when that, uh, if, if that opportunity comes up. I mean, the media loves to focus on, on um, if you like, uh, people are more on the fringes of the mainstream, you know, people uh, uh, in terms of behaviour, in terms of, you know, even, even those visuals of vapours puffing like a steam train. Uh, it's, uh, you know, how, think about how those types of images play out and how they affect the cause. I mean, that's part of, part of the challenge of dealing with the media. Um, but, uh, but I don't think that the mainstream media itself is out to get you. I think uh, many journalists do want to actually find out more about this. They, they want to actually see all sides of the story. I think um, certainly in Australia, uh, some of them uh, are quite, uh, you know, quite convinced that they're not getting the whole story from, from the usual sources um, and they're prepared to, to dig and, and come and talk. Uh, when those opportunities come, opportunities come up, uh, take them uh, and then use your networks to find out where they are. Um, but just quickly, the, the other thing I, I just sort of say is that you talk about expertise. So uh, don't don't just think of uh, while you advocate in your own countries, uh, don't just think about that. Think about the fact that you've probably got common experiences right across, you know, internationally across the region. And I remember talking to a CAFRA meeting in Bangkok a couple of years ago where I actually said that, look, you, you've got more in common than what divides you. Uh, because you're dealing with, in a, in a way, a common, common core, a common enemy, a common opponent. Uh, um, different governments, yes. Uh, different, different uh, lobbyists. You know, uh, and then suppose, but some like Michael Bloomberg are sort of popping up everywhere now. But, but basically, uh, you know, swap notes, share experiences, get insights that 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 may help you in your own country from other countries. So, uh, that's one of the. I think one of the strongest uh, assets that uh, the vaping community has, it's got an international network and uh, that information exchange is absolutely vital to uh, uh, getting the cause on the mainstream media agenda. Yeah, I have to agree with that 100% because I know when I started, and I'm guessing, Peter, it might have been the same for you because we started around the same time. You know, we thought we were on our own. We didn't know there were other people out there, right? It was just like, okay, I'm doing this. Who do I call? I mean, I went to my first GFN and luckily, thank you, John Summers and Sarah Jakes and all the people at NNA UK who took us under their wing to kind of guide us. And I think that that's a responsibility that we have as vaping advocates is to take other advocates under our wing and show them the ropes and support them because we are stronger together. Like, you know, Terry said, the situation in the Philippines may be different than the situation in the United States or the situation in Malaysia or New Zealand or Australia, but we're all fighting a common enemy. And the enemy itself isn't the public health people or the governments per se. The enemy is the misinformation or the disinformation. The second part of the enemy is the death and the disease that's caused by preventing people to have access to safer options. Peter, would you agree? Oh, you can't? Okay. I, cool. agree. I, I, I agree. I agree. <laughs> yeah, I'm just, yeah. Liana, what is your take on all of this so far? My take on all of this? That's pretty a broad question. Can you narrow it down a little bit? Okay. Uh, okay. When, you know, all right, what Terry said about the media and about, you know, the community and people working together and sharing resources. I completely agree with that. I had an opportunity like that pop up and I was really noob. I mean, like eight months into this whole thing, into vaping and everything. And a Channel 3 journalist 
had read something that I had written on Facebook regarding vaping. And it was, you know, pretty, pretty good little rant there. And um, she said, I read what you wrote. Because I'm like, how did you find me? Like, really? And she wanted to do an interview with me the next day. And I had just found out what I could about the MSA and everything that was really going on in the United States. And um, she actually wanted to come into my salon. And I said, no, you know, I have client privacy here. You know, I'm doing somebody's hair. That's not going to happen right now. But uh, I just, you know, slapped on my Vaping Save Lives t-shirt. I told the client I was working on. She goes, now, do you understand what MSA stands for? Like, she had a valid point. You need to, to speak it out. You know, she was helping me do just that, Terry. She was helping me understand what I was talking about have a full grasp on it, stay focused and on track. And I did that. I did that interview standing outside my salon, you know, like eight months into this, like knowing what I knew at that time. Um, you know, that was, there was that and there was a rally and that was a pretty much the beginning for me. And so Nancy and other advocates around me have been doing just that. They have taken me under their wing. They're feeding me the right information they are giving me the right reading materials. Um, I'm tuning in when I can between my two businesses and learning my enemy, but I'm also looking for solutions. And um, just watching that clip again, be the film before this show is very enlightening. And, and everybody, there are a few different differing opinions on exactly what's going to work for us, mm -hmm. you know, to, to get in, to be heard, to, to have this be effective and, and have THR end up where we want it to be. Um, so I feel like my whole take on this is that we do need to come to a, an agreement of what our next target is. We yeah. need to all come to agreement and say, let's kind of like get our energies there. And I do like the idea that Peter talked about of focusing on capitals. And so that's what we did and continue to do here. And now we're down to lawsuits and judges. You know, um, but every country is different and when the enemy is, is the same, I agree with you on both of those points, Nancy, completely. Um, we, we, it's, it's about saving lives and, um, yeah, I, I agree can with I, everything. Yeah, yeah can sorry, I just, go ahead. Can I just jump in on that? I think, um, th listen, and I, I, that, that's really great, Leanna, but I, I think you also reminded me that language is very important here. Um, don't talk about them as the enemy. Uh, they are your right. opponents. You can talk about them like like a political opponent, um, but they're not the enemy. I mean, they've got a different point of view to you, you. They're absolutely convinced in many cases of their absolute rightness, and that's very irritating and frustrating and makes you angry. Um, but I think you've got to try and understand their mindsets as well as part of advocacy that... Uh, where do they come from? Where does uh, where does um, uh, a, you know a leading? I don't like to name names in conversations like this in case they're listening. But uh, you know where where do leading tobacco control advocates come from uh, in terms of the way they think? I mean, uh, when you think about it, I mean, vaping in particular is a very disruptive technology in terms of where, where tobacco control has been for the last fifty years. I mean, no, uh, if 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 ultimately the cause succeeds. Uh, effectively, it's, it's basically invalidating, at least overturning a lot of these people's life's work. They don't like that. They're, they're fighting back to defend their legacies as much as defend the, you know, what they believe is right. And, uh, um, and, and, and sort of approaching it with that sort of uh, thing, idea at the back of your mind uh, um, in terms of how you present, how you advocate, I think is very important. Uh, because if you actually try and understand your opponent and get inside their head, then you can actually uh, try and be one step ahead of them. That is absolutely true. And Roberto covers that really well. Helps us understand how how science works and all the all the different platforms. That I don't have the words, okay? Please excuse me. I don't have the right words, but all the different ways and, and the methods that they have to go through and the years it takes and, you know, for them to form their thesis, for them to, like, prove their point and the information that they have gotten 
they're limited with part of the pie. We're just trying to say, this is the rest of the pie. Let's include all of it and look at all of it. I can completely agree with you. Um, yeah. I could be as passionate as I want, but if I don't present it well, yeah, I'm not going to be heard. That's it. Mm. That's exactly it. I mean, and it, it's very hard sometimes. And Terry, I'm not ignoring you, Peter. Don't worry. Uh, maybe you can give some insight into this. Um, it's very hard to get inside the head of a politician when really they've got 15,000 different things going on at one time. And it's one of these things where you have to take your issue and somehow make it relatable to them with what their issue is. And that can be a very hard thing to do. Terry? Uh, it can be very hard, um, particularly if the politician or politicians have very firm views themselves and they're very hard to, to change. But again, I think it comes back to where they're getting their advice from. Who's giving them, who, you know, who's giving them their briefings, who's, uh, um, who's effectively selecting the evidence they look at. Um, and, and certainly, I think in Australia at least, uh, politicians are very reluctant to go against the medical lobby, very reluctant to go against the, uh, the known tobacco control experts because uh, they think it's politically or electorally even dangerous for them to do so. Um, so uh, just simply saying I vape and I vote doesn't wash with them. Uh, I think, uh, uh, but it's again, as I said, in health, everybody's cause is the most important known to mankind. So you've actually got to compete with other, other, other interests as well as uh, with your uh, opponents on the issue. So, um, but but certainly, I think that when it comes to vaping, the question about uh, about uh, uh, relative harm or relative safety versus tobacco smoking, uh, the the potential to save lives and improve health. Uh, the uh, uh, the um, the great potential in terms of um, uh, ending you know getting away from uh, the, the dangers the, the the deadly dangers of passive smoking uh, in terms of third parties I think these are these are all things backed by evidence in terms of uh, you know keep, and that's one thing I think about, I, I like about the the um, harm reduction uh, advocacy community is it jumps on the latest information, the latest studies very quickly and uh, shares them around. Um, and some, some are more, uh, uh, well, more savvy than others, I guess, but, but uh, knowing where those latest studies are, both, both pro and pro and anti uh, is, is, is very important because if you're ahead of the, if you're ahead of the decision makers, uh, they might actually take you a bit more seriously. It's when you, it's when you advocate so firmly that there's no room to move no room to to uh, to compromise uh, and that that's when you get your own position your own own um, reputation as an advocate into into difficulty so it's it's finding that right balance finding a happy medium and being prepared to compromise by seeing wh where what governments are wanting to do what they're wanting not to do in some cases but also the other political and and and, um, and scientific and, and and lobbying pressures on them yeah, I mean, when we dealt with New Zealand, for example, Liana, it's like we're all talking to Liana. It's like Liana's getting a master class. Yes, you guys I am. Are in the audience I am are so too. privileged. <laughs> um, you know, when we approached them, when Jan and I approached them, uh, you know, we had to tie it into the fact that we were in a way lucky that there was the smoke-free goal. So we could tie what we were saying into that smoke-free goal. And we could tie it into the fact that we have a national health system and look at how much money this is costing you and people are smoking and you know it, so you've everybody wherever they are has to find that relatable issue that's a political issue and tie it to that would you agree with me peter um i totally agree 100 percent, just like uh, what terry said and uh, before i say my comment on that I also understand where Liana is coming from. It's like a back to the future. Like four years ago, I, I feel exactly how you feel. I've done exactly what you've done. Being called to go on air, talk about this and all that. And uh, don't worry, um, it's part of the learning process. Um, yes, Nancy's right. Um, and same thing with Terry. I think as advocates, sometimes we're, we're so passionate and uh, we're so overwhelmed with the amount of knowledge that we know. 
that uh, at times we take a very hard stand because I have the knowledge, I have the wisdom, I have the power that maybe you, Mr. Politician, you don't understand. Sometimes I think we fall on those uh, cracks because we need to understand that these are also that we are talking to politicians. As such, we have to be politicians as well in dealing with them. We have to find the right angle. We, we need, if we need to shout, we have to shout to get their attention in, in, in a very civilized manner. Or we, we very uh, humbly commend them, raise their point so that they will listen to us more attentively. Um, so what I'm trying to say is this, these are all skills that uh, we can all harness. I guess as, as, as advocates, we, we just really need to understand when to tap them. As to those specific connections uh, on how we can uh, break the barrier to be able to engage the policymakers, I think that's a case-to-case -case scenario. And again, what's good with this is just like what Terry said, um, there are other tools outside your own borders. So maybe uh, the, the tax angle that is being looked at uh, right now in Malaysia might also work in certain jurisdictions. The, um, the, the, the lobby here in the Philippines with respect to uh, uh, risk proportionate taxation might also work in certain jurisdictions. You can always reach out and ask those, uh, I would just say, uh, senior advocates with respect to, because some have started earlier than the others. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I, did, I never met that it is about age. It's just that they've started 10 years ago in advocate and whatnot. So maybe they can share. Uh, specific angles uh, on how they have engaged their 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 policymakers, and maybe the new advocates can take the cue from there. Yeah, and yeah. learn from our mistakes, P Terry. Uh, was, yeah, that's actually sort of reminded me, uh, Peter, and of um, another issue. I think that advocates, particularly passionate advocates, need to think about, and that's social media. Uh, um, certainly. Uh, Particularly Twitter, I think. Um, mm. uh, you know, Liana said that the you know, journalists picked up on what she said on Facebook, and they do. So, so you've got to be, if you want to seriously advocate, you need to, to bear in mind that uh, whatever you say can be taken down and used against you, as well as by you know for for something. Mm -hmm. uh, the second thing is that uh, um, taking taking on politicians, taking on uh, tobacco control advocates. Uh, in a personal way on social media, it's, it's just, just counterproductive. It undermines you, it undermines your cause. Uh, I know they can annoy you. I like certainly, you know, at least one of them gets up my nose all the time. But, uh, um, but uh, if, uh, and I certainly know that in terms of um, politicians, uh, they don't like being uh, singled out as uh, potential killers, for instance, uh, because they've, they've got a, a, a cold attitude to vaping. Uh, that type of personal attack, that type of personal abuse, or they see it as personal abuse, uh, can actually set the whole cause back, set yourself back as well in terms of your reputation. And uh, and um, and just because you might use a, a, a Twitter um, alias, uh, doesn't mean they can find out, can't find out who you are. So of course you've got to bear in mind that uh, um, whatever you say has to be uh, uh, well. You don't want to you don't want to end up in court. Let's put it that way. Uh, yeah. but, but certainly, I think showing that you're more respectful than your opposition to the opposition uh, is always always the best way to go. I mean, it gives you the moral high ground, if it, even if it doesn't give you the argument. Yeah, I mean, you take the high road, okay? And they may attack you, and Ace has been through this, and obviously Terry's been through this, okay? I've been through it. Um, they attack you. You know, and they do make it personal. I mean, because they all operate basically the, the anti, tend to go for that emotional outrage that we've been talking about for the past couple of days. Don't sink to their level. Um, when I think of an effective social media presence and effective messaging, I think of Peter. And that's kind of why I wanted him on this panel. Um, Peter, can you give us a brief overview of how you guys do that? Um I'd say I have a very creative group of members here in the Philippines. Um, right now, for next year, we're, uh, I have very uh, social media savvy uh, members. I'll give you an idea for the benefit of Liana and Terry. Um, 
I don't know how much you followed social media, but uh, TikTok, it's an it's an online, it's a Facebook thing that's very big here in the Philippines. So we did that in you know, in uh, one of the social media campaigns that we did in Facebook. I think we did that sometime August. Um, we just wanted vapors to 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 come up with uh, something about vaping. And the amount of mileage we had with it was, it was really great. And the number of new members that we picked up, it was huge. And and these are just not members that, you know, that you lose a contact with. Uh, because we realized that uh, the pandemic will still be here. You can't hold meetings, you can't hold uh, events that, we, that the big businesses used to have here every year before. So you you gotta be you have to be very um, you have to be very creative, and there's still a few right now still message me, and uh, I'm very happy they're they're asking sir how come the the vape bill was not discussed in live TV, because some of them uh, they don't understand how laws are being passed, and. Uh, when there's a deliberation uh, on a particular law, it's being broadcasted in our local airwaves. So they watch it. I can see them comment in the Facebook lives. But uh, they don't understand that it's not a priority of the senators. So sometimes they will say, tomorrow we will discuss the vape bill. And instead of two hours on a COVID bill, they'll do five hours. Then they will not be able to discuss the vape bill. And everybody will be messaging me, sir, what happened? What happened? It's, they're like that. So to that particular extent, I'm, I'm very happy. Uh, for next, and, and these are just the, some of the outrageous ideas that, we, that, we, that we're using. Uh, right now, the big thing here in the Philippines are, there's an online game called Axis. So I have my team now studying how we can tie that up with vaping. Because for me, in social media, the idea is get their attention impress them and then they will listen and hopefully out of those 10 people that will listen you get one or two you're okay so you need to find a way to reach out to other people it doesn't necessarily have to always be about vaping 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 um it's it's just really if i i'm still in the infancy stage of how we'll do it but i'm already talking to a couple of vapor members i'm having them uh come up with that idea so that we can grasp the attention and then once we're friends already we'll tell them in depth about the advocacy and hopefully we get people to support us so that's what we're doing aside from of course uh posting updates on the bills and uh certain uh, what you call these milestones achieved by partner advocates from other jurisdictions okay liana do you have any questions I have just learned so comments. much and I'm just sitting here, you know, I've, I've always known personally been <laughs> deep down inside that respect and putting yourself in or attempting to from wherever you are, putting yourself in the shoes of the person that you are trying to reach is crucial. And sometimes with a mind like mine, that may slip, but it, you know, we make jokes, but you know, I agree with Terry and Peter. But especially, Terry, that it is important to know who it is that you're addressing. It's important to know all the work that they put into getting to there. You know, they did, you know, as as corrupt as everything is, they didn't just buy their way in. They did a certain amount of work um, to get there. And they do have a lot of other issues to deal with. And it is always important to come at someone with respect. You know, as furious as you may be, if you can't, it's better to be silent and get someone else to move forward, forward for you. That's why... I don't buy into um, some of the issues and some of or comment on some things or like certain things on Twitter because I do find them blatantly disrespectful, even though I completely disagree with that person's point of view. Um, mm -hmm. I don't need to engage in that. But um, someone puts forth a good stating fact and it's backed by some good science right there. I will retweet that. I am not an expert. I am very new to this. Um, and I want to learn how to do it the right way. So I appreciate every all the information that I have been 
um, listening to that you guys, everyone, the since scope has begun and had the time to present me with. And um, I feel extremely privileged to learn. And I'm, I'm just really grateful. You know, who knows what you make of me? I might, I might be something someday. <laughs> might make a difference. Well, I think the Sorry. other thing to keep in mind that this is a long game. It's not going to happen overnight. That's uh, for sure. You know, um, it's, it's, uh, you know, changing mindsets may actually depend on some of those, um, uh, those uh, tobacco control uh, uh, gurus uh, actually pa passing, passing on, you know, retiring, going on to other things. Uh, um, it may mean that governments need to change or ministers need to change. Um, uh, but uh, um, it's certainly, and particularly at this particular time in, in terms of health and health policy, uh, it's all pandemic, pandemic, pandemic. Uh, uh, vaping, tobacco control, tobacco harm reduction are second order issues to many politicians and many bureaucrats. So um, it's certainly at this particular time, it's very important to be patient. But uh, but the type of gains that uh, you're wanting, that you're wanting to see, uh, will not happen tomorrow, they, but they may happen next year or the year after, or in some cases, they may not even happen this decade, but you've just got to keep plugging away at it. And uh, if you're seen as reliable, respectful, and your arguments and your advocacy is based on uh, science and on doc, you know, reliable information and data, um, that, that uh, ultimately, you just, you know, the chipping away will pay off. It will. It absolutely will. Um, I mean, I see it happening with Peter. You know, I see it's, you know, things are changing. I mean, it's interesting to me. I look at the United States and the United States and the UK, right? The UK is on what we would consider the right track. I mean, they, the TPD and they had their issues. Brexit probably saved vaping. Let's be honest. Okay. Um, and then I look at what's going on in the United States and then I look at what's happening, you know, in Africa or Latin America or, you know, Asia and, I see hope, and I've said this before, and Peter, you've said it too, hope with a big H, you know? <laughs> and um, a lot of people have said to me recently, you know, during this thing, you know, no, nah, you know, you can't give up the hope, okay? Because ultimately, there's more of us than there are of them. That's number one. Yeah, they may have the money, but we have the facts. We're the evidence. Clive said it, we're the evidence, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and like Peter, and like, and like Terry said, this is a long game. This is a long game. So if you're in it, you're in it, you know, you're not in it for the money, even though they keep telling us all tobacco company shills and we all have like millions and millions of dollars and, <laughs> you know, servants and we drive Teslas and stuff. Um, oh yeah. Every day, every day you know, um, <laughs> But yeah, I mean, that's kind of, you know, it's a long game. And the thing that, that, that kind of disheartens me a lot, and I don't know if Peter feels the same way. I'm going to ask you, answer this question. Do you get frustrated sometimes when you see advocates that are out there and because of their behavior and because of the things they do, it paints all of us as some kind of radical, nasty, horrible human being? I mean, that I when I advocate, I'm representing myself and everyone else. Peter? Uh, I'll be honest with you, it does, but I try to, to you know, um, stop myself to be so much stressed about it uh, because when they're already like that, I've tried engaging uh, fellow local advocates before with that, and it's just stressful, utter waste of time. Um, because I think they're doing it, uh, those certain detrimental acts, uh, speeches, um, with the firm belief that they are doing the right things. Because yeah. they're just they're not just doing this, that those things or saying those things just for the heck of it. So to debate with them, put your your, your time uh, to engage them. It's it's really a waste of time. Uh, through the years, I've I've. I've tried to maintain to influence those things that I can control um, because as what Nancy said before and what uh, Terry echoed now, it's a long game. You should just pick your battles. There are really just some, some pointless little arguments down the road. And uh, as it is, we are already, uh, you know, we only have so little time to, to do all those things. 
So, but to answer the question, Nancy, yes, I get frustrated, but uh, I just try not to mind it and just control whatever I can. Yeah, no, and that's what you got to do. You have to focus because you could burn out really quick if you don't focus and get involved in all this other back chat and the things that people throw up that to, to divide and conquer and all these other things. So focus. Um, Terry, we have two questions about Australia for you. Are you ready for this? I'll do my best. <laughs> okay. Um, do you think that there is any chance that they can that we, meaning Australians, can have this prescription model overturned and manufacturing happen ever on Australian soil? And part two of that, I'm going to give you both of them at the same time, is part of the reason of not following the UK model to do with the Republicans in the Australian Parliament. So pick one and go with it. Well, the first one's probably the easiest. Um, okay. Look, I think yes, but again, it's a long game. And it certainly won't happen while, uh, you know, the current Australian health minister is the Australian health minister. Uh, he's got uh, so entrenched views on this issue that uh, nothing's going to change his mind. And to be honest, uh, some of the um, some of the um, invective and the, the, the um, criticism directed personally at him has actually hardened his attitude. It hasn't made him more flexible. Uh, uh, in terms of the actual process, I think it's it is starting to be seen in the mainstream media as being, uh, well, rather absurd. Um, the fact that uh, hardly anybody, as I understand, it's getting prescriptions, hardly any GPs are, are actually willing to prescribe it and hardly any pharmacists are prepared to dispense it. So, um, uh, and, and again, I think uh, uh, it will collapse under its own weight, its own, own cumbersome weight, uh, but it, yeah, you know, there's a little thing in Australia, probably in May next year, called a federal election, and I think nothing's going to change before then. Um, in terms of the the overall politics of it, it's uh, um, I think it's not a it's not a Liberal Labor or party, you know, left right issue. It's actually a um, it, it's it's I think part part of the image problem that vaping has in Australian politics, and it might happen in I think other jurisdictions as well, is that it's seen as a fringe issue. Uh, uh, a libertarian issue, you know, my right to do what I want type issue. Uh, it's not seen as a health issue in the way that perhaps I think it really should be. Um, in terms of, in terms of you know, lives saved, in terms of health improved, um, in terms of um, uh, smoking, you know, new smokers being prevented or, or avoided. Um, and and uh, um, and again, I think. Vaping does have an image problem here uh, because of the way that it has been advocated um, up till now. Uh, and, and again, I think uh, the one thing that uh, is lacking in Australia that other countries do have in the in the region is a, is a coherent, coordinated and uh, you know, vaping community uh, in terms of vaping advocates who are prepared to work with each other. Um, uh, I think uh, um, what what unites you should be and is greater than what divides you, but that doesn't seem to be always the attitude in, in, in the advocacy community. And I think that needs to be overcome uh, because it's quite easy for uh, the usual suspects to divide and conquer and to make uh, you know, pronouncements about, about uh, uh, vapors and, and, and advocates on, on uh, particularly in social media uh, that, uh, and, and, didn't, and you know, get picked up on the mainstream uh, that are, are wrong um, and unfair. Um, um, and blatantly wrong, even. Uh, but uh, um, but certainly uh, those attitudes get entrenched, and um, and certainly uh, they're controlling the narrative more than they they deserve to at the moment. And uh, I think it's up to the vaping community and, and advocates within it to actually uh, take that on. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, they're talking about um, Greg Hunt now. Um, Mark asked if he had any health knowledge or background, and everybody answered and said no. He's a lawyer. So as far as you know, he doesn't have any health background, right? Uh, well, he's health minister and he's been health minister for four years now. And you actually learn a lot. I, I, look, I don't, I'm not, a, I'm not medically trained. I'm not health professionally trained. I ended up working in the policy area as a, as a generalist political advisor and bureaucrat. I mean, it's a, uh, you learn things as you go. Um, if you've got half a brain and lawyers have half a brain, usually, well, maybe sometimes. Peter, do you have half a brain? Um, <laughs> that, um, uh, you know, uh, that, uh, it, 
you don't have to be an expert in that sense to, to actually make a judgment on the facts and on the information on the data. Um, and I think, again, I, I don't want to talk about individuals, including Mr. Hunt. Uh, I think, uh, again, you have to get inside their minds and think about why they are thinking, why they're acting the way they are, as opposed to just thinking as I've seen some people uh, in the, you know, some advocates uh, uh, over enthusiastically go at our minister um, in a personal way, as if he's uh, uh, blowpilled, stroking his cat, and uh, wanting to kill James Bond. But but uh, uh, that doesn't help. It just does not help. But uh, some people just get so passionate, so worked up about it, they don't actually see that uh, the, the you know the forest for the trees, and they lose their perspective and. It's very important in advocacy to never lose your perspective. And it goes back, and I think uh, Peter and, and Liana have act mm. really highlighted it. To, if you actually sort of step back, keep keep your own perspective and actually try and understand how this all plays in the wider scheme of things, you're more likely to be successful. Okay. Um, I've got a question for you, Peter. Department of Health has disavowed Loxon's statement at COP. How do you think the Department of Health will proceed with this government and the next? Sorry, come again. Uh, that was so fast, I didn't catch it. Um, oh, sorry. The Department of Health has disavowed Loxon's statement at COP. How do you think the Department of Health will proceed with this government and then the next? Hmm, that's a tough one. But uh, going out on, the, on a limb here, I think they will still be the same. What they're doing right now and what they're doing from the next government and moving forward. Like I said uh, from the previous discussions, it's going to be very difficult to buy to bite the hand that feeds you. Uh, we, we all know who influences them, right? So mm -hmm. yeah. So I think that's the. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to stop myself here. I think the the the, the 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 thing is. There's a reason why they're disavowing that particular. There's a, there's a moving force why they're 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 coming up with a statement right now, um, and uh, I I think your guess is as good as mine, on on where where that is uh, coming from. So until and unless that uh, that flux of uh, donation continues to come in, um, I think it will still be the same stand regardless of the administration of government here in the Philippines. Okay, fair enough. Peter, we've, um, Terry, we've been asking everybody who's been on panels to tell us and tell everyone if they had a moment to speak to the COP9 delegates and give a message. What would your message be, Terry? <laughs> uh, I don't know, I, I don't know about you, but I've been following the daily communiques from, um, from COP9 and they don't seem to be able to talk to each other, let alone talk to anybody else. <laughs> But, um, That's uh, what I gathered. Uh, they're, very, they're very divided. Look, I think basically my message is to listen, uh, to listen beyond your comfort zone, to actually listen to consumers, to listen to uh, uh, the community at large, not to assume that you're up in your own ivory tower, uh, knowing everything and that assuming that everything should do it, you know, everything should be as you want it to be and people should do as you want them to do. Um, and, and to effective, basically be open-minded to all the evidence. I mean, not just that evidence that suits what they want to do or what uh, FCTC wants to do, but also evidence uh, that disruptive te technologies, harm reduction technologies like vaping do have a, do have a place, do have a value, and, uh, and that it's more than just uh, um, adv advocacy and advocate rhetoric. That, that, uh, there is absolutely substance and... Uh, and doing what what I've been sort of urging everyone to do here is to, you know, not ex, not assume that you've got the, the final word on everything. Uh, they have to do the same, and they they have to also um, get out of this absolutely stupid mindset that everything is a uh, you know all the strings are being pulled by big tobacco that uh, um, that it's some sort of conspiracy that uh, people are actually daring to question what uh, what to uh, FCTC is all about. Um, so the bottom line is, you know, get out there, listen to the real world, and then be prepared to actually have a debate and a discussion rather than just uh, make pronouncements from on high. 
Yeah, no, fair enough. Last question here, and I'm not sure who this is for, so I'm going to throw this at you, Terry. Um, do you think we're going to see similar disconnects between politicians and health departments in other countries, such as what happened in the Philippines? Uh, that was quite extraordinary, and I don't know the full story. I mean, maybe Peter Peter has you know has has the inside ear there, but um, uh, but certainly that that outburst, well, the outburst from the the um, Philippines government uh, just, just disavowing, disowning their, their delegation, I, I think was was remarkable. Um, but from the statement that the delegation made, it was actually it was actually exactly what I was just talking about. It was actually <laughs> saying that you you know it isn't cut and dry. That things aren't so simple. That you you can can actually take a bigger bigger picture view of all of this. And uh, um, clearly clearly. Um, the phones must have been ringing hot from the FCTC secretariat to the health ministry in, in Manila uh, uh, to get that to happen. But uh, look, I, I think that was that was rare and unusual. Uh, but I do think that when you talk about politicians and 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 tobacco harm reduction and tobacco control, you've got to remember that politicians come and go, but bureaucrats are there forever. And, uh, and and as I said right at the beginning, uh, ministers are briefed by their bureaucrats, they're briefed by their experts, and it's, uh, you know, they're the people who actually pull the strings on all of this far more than any politician does. And uh, um, so when you are engaging, when you are advocating, it's actually persuading some of those bureaucrats to give you an audience, give you a hearing as much as any, any minister or any politician. Yeah getting inside that kind of ties into something I was saying to um, Liana is getting inside that's what you've got to do we've got to do Absolutely. and the best way and the best way to do that is to be relatable to make it relatable to be human to be understanding like we've all been just talking about you know understand somebody else's perspective find the connection build on that connection be but it's also important to, with consumers that your stories are legitimate. They, 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 yes. they are evidence in their own right. I think Clive Bates has said that as well. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's uh, it's very important to tell those stories in a way that uh, policy politicians, policymakers, decision makers uh, can understand. Um, um, and certainly in Australia, there's a parliamentary inquiry where uh, some of those experts absolutely patronise the 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 living daylights out of out of consumers as being not qualified yes you are qualified i mean you, you you know what it was like to smoke and you know what it's like not to smoke and and then you know what vaping or, or other uh harm reduction choices you've made have actually improved your health and your your, your life and, and the life and the lives of those around you so that's legitimate i think politicians need to understand that a bit better than they do though yeah Peter, uh, do you have any final thought? yeah um just going back to that question you asked uh, Terry a while ago, uh, just a very quick comment. If uh, I think the question was, if we're going to see some similar things happening, uh, like what happened in the Philippines with other governments, mm -hmm. uh, here's my comment. Uh, I'm not sure, but I certainly hope so with the big H. Um, because I just go back to like when the first time you keep on engaging people when we started our advocacy not everybody listens um not even your best friend but three months down the road you will see him vaping instead of smoking cigarettes uh um, combustible cigarettes but he will never acknowledge that three months ago you were correct but he is vaping yeah. so i certainly hope with a big h that this is a first step in the right direction this uh, the 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 the, the 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 DFA secretary hopefully will uh, open the gates to everybody everybody else to look at the body of evidence. Um, it's there. I mean, it will speak for itself. We've been doing this for a long time, so uh, hopefully it gets replicated in other jurisdictions. With hope. Thanks. Big H. Big H. Um, Big H. Liana, do you have a thought that you'd like to share before we close out? I just want to tell you thank you. I really do. And um, I, I appreciate all the wise guidance that has been handed down to me. And it's definitely going to change my approach from this day forward. Because there are a couple little hashtags I probably should let go of. 
But, you know, <laughs> like the brainwashing one in particular. <laughs> but, you know, with that name in there. But Terry's right. And the way he put it actually got through to me. And I'm pretty hard-headed. So the facts that you've presented to me as a brand new advocate and as a consumer um, are very important to me. And Peter's methodology, the, what worked and what is working in the Philippines, and yes, I do hope it influences other countries as well. Um, it, if, if it worked for someone, it may be effective for you. It gives me courage to move forward. So I thank you. Thank you for that. And and Nancy, I never thought I'd say this, but thank you for the hundreds of pages of documents that you sent to me to <laughs> help me to understand what it is I'm dealing with and, and, and encouraging me to come on here and uh, even even on a day like this for me. And I'm sorry yeah. that I'm a little bit of a wreck, you guys. It's okay, guys. Um, uh, if you don't mind, Peter and Terry and everybody watching, we'd like to take a moment of silence for all the people that we've lost to tobacco harm are you guys cool with that yeah i lost my dad yesterday terry I didn't even oh know. i'm so sorry to hear so um do you want to say something liana we'll just i think we should just all say what we have to say in our heart because there's there's so many lives and there's so much pain and there's so much emptiness behind this and it is a it's a driving force of our passion in okay and what we do and if we can uh find a way to prevent that and we have and let's go about it the right way folks so let's just have that moment for everyone that that you've lost every friend Amen. Thank you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go, you guys. Thank you. I'm, I'm dissolving. It's okay. Thank you for joining us, Liana. Thank you, Terry. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, everybody who's watching. Up next you, in Nancy. about a half hour or so is going to be Mottawa. So we'll see you then. Good night. Stay safe, Bye, everybody. Bye, everyone.